Women are, in a certain sense, like the Jewish people. So wrote the New York immigrant journalist Chaim Malitz in his 1918 book, Die Heim und die Freu, The Home and the Woman, in a section that described the lack of recognition that women received for their work. Jews, too, he noted, failed to gain respect in the world. While Malitz suggested that women were like Jews, Many more observers of Jewish life in the late 19th and early 20th centuries depicted male Jews in terms more often ascribed to women. Particularly in the societies of the industrialized West, Jewish men, even though they had assimilated to Western culture, were seen as unmanly. As the historian Joan Wallach Scott reminds us, Gender is not merely about the socially and culturally defined differences between the sexes. It is also, in her words, a primary way of signifying relationships of power. By caricaturing Jewish men as feminized, anti-Semites and their fellow travelers attempted to strip them of the power and honor otherwise due them as men, and especially as economically successful men. Jewish men, in turn, as they experienced emancipation and the conditions of middle class life and anticipated the rewards of both, responded to their disparagement in general culture by creating negative representations of Jewish women, struggling to gain respect and power for themselves as men in the larger society. Male Jews defined an identity that not only distinguished themselves from women, but that also displaced their own anxieties upon women. Just as Jews remained the primal other in ostensibly secular cultures that were still marked by Christian prejudices, so Jewish men, first in the countries of Western and Central Europe, and later in America, constructed a modern Jewish identity that devalued women the other within the Jewish community. To study the sexual politics of Jewish identity at the turn of the 20th century, it's useful to focus upon those who articulated most strongly the perniciousness of Jewish traits and the consequent unacceptability of Jews within society. I shall therefore pay particular attention to European anti-Semites and to those Jews who internalize their message, whom we've come to label self-hating Jews. Of course, most Europeans were not vicious anti-Semites, nor were most Jews self-loathing. However, extremists often point to social and psychological tensions that others feel or express in more muted terms. Since even those who supported civil rights for Jews saw them as beings in need of and capable of improvement, and viewed Judaism largely with contempt, it is, I think, fair to state that the prevailing cultural attitudes towards Jews in the very societies they were eager to join were generally disparaging. Although the racism of the extremists changed the terms of debate by asserting the futility of hopes for Jewish self-improvement, Anti-Semites and self-hating Jews voiced the essential conflict in men's shaping of their Jewish identity. In the last decades of the 19th century, anti-Semitism acquired a political dimension in Western and Central Europe that baffled Jews of the time, who had optimistically assumed that history moved only in the direction of an enlightened progress. Moreover, the development of a political ideology of anti-Semitism reinforced and legitimated the social and cultural manifestations of anti-Semitism that had never been eradicated by Enlightenment rationalism. Ironically, the very generation of Jews who had acquired the financial resources, education, and manners of the bourgeoisie did not achieve the social status and psychological well-being associated with their class. Instead, they were compelled to refashion their identities against a backdrop of anti-Semitism, and an anti-Semitism that was also misogynist. 
This coincidence of anti-Semitism and misogyny is understandable, for in disputing their subordination and asserting a claim to equality, both modern Jews and modern women disrupted the anti-Semites' nostalgic and anti-modern vision of a smoothly functioning, non-egalitarian, hierarchical social order in which subordinate uh, groups, like women and Jews, knew their place. The male Jew, in particular, so visible because of his brilliantly successful participation in the economy and in the culture of the larger society, was the target of anti-Semitic bile. Increasingly, he was depicted as womanish. Like women, Jewish men were seen as weak, physically soft, and rounded. As for their characters, they were represented as materialistic, manipulative, and lacking in moral vigor and honor. That is, they shared with women a behavioral style found among the socially powerless. In his recent study, Jewish Self-Hatred, Anti-Semitism and the Hidden Language of the Jews, Sander Gilman adds to the parallels drawn between Jews and women, their supposed false and manipulative use of language, their faulty logic, in their substitution of mockery and satire for true humor. In the German-speaking countries, even assimilated Jews were depicted as unable to use German properly. Their language remained encoded with Yiddish inflections and intonations. And that was the case also for caricatures, anti-Semitic caricatures of uh, Jews in France during the Dreyfus Affair, where all of the uh, all of the dialogue of the, uh, of the caricatures was done uh, as though Jews spoke with a thick Yiddish or German accent. In analyzing the theme of a joke included in an early 19th century German collection of Jewish jokes, Gilman notes that this joke reflects the prevailing sentiment that Jews, when oppressed, can attack only verbally. In this, once again, they are like women whose lack of strength is compensated for by their wit. Even sophisticated interpreters of human behavior could read the nonviolent reactions of Jewish men to the disparaging acts or speech of anti-Semites as unmanly. After all, Sigmund Freud himself reacted with a sense of shame to a story told him in his childhood by his father, Jacob a story that became one of his central childhood memories. Jacob Freud recounted that many years before, in their hometown of Freiburg, Moravia, he had had an encounter on the street with a non-Jew who knocked his new fur cap from his head and shouted at him to get off the sidewalk. And what did you do? asked the young Sigmund. I stepped into the road and picked up my cap, Jacob replied. That response, Freud recalled, did not seem heroic to me from a big, strong man. The Jewish father was found wanting as a model of masculinity by his famous son, who based his theories of healthy male psychological development upon the resolution of the Oedipal conflict of son and father. This association of stereotypic female traits with male Jewishness appears explicitly and with great clarity in the writings of German and Austrian anti-Semites who were, virtually without exception, anti-feminist as well as anti-Semitic. The German youth movement, which was permeated with anti-Semitic attitudes, not only contrasted Aryan male beauty with Jewish ugliness, it also excluded women from membership since only men were fit to lead the folk, the people. At German and Austrian universities, fraternities and other student groups permeated with folkish nationalist ideology likewise barred Jews from membership. Jews then established their own student associations that engaged in many of the pursuits promoted by the fraternities, such as the sport of dueling, which was quite in vogue in the latter part of the 19th century, and sporting a scar on one's cheek was a sign uh, of one's prowess. In refusing to accept Jews as worthy opponents in the duels that established their masculinity, German and Austrian youth treated male Jews as though they were women. 
In the eyes of their fellow students, Jews, whatever their institutional affiliation, continued to lack honor. Within the Jewish community, Zionists took the lead in combating the anti-Semitic depiction of the Jew by presenting a counter-image, the new Jew, who was the mirror image of the anti-Semitic stereotype. If the diaspora Jew was physically weak and soft, the Zionist new Jew was strong and muscular. If the diaspora Jew was manipulative and wily, the Zionist new Jew was simple and direct. If the diaspora Jew was a huckster, the Zionist new Jew was a peasant farmer or an efficient technocrat. The Zionists not only rejected the diaspora societies that treated Jews as eternal aliens, no matter how complete their assimilation. In seeking to create the new Jew, they rejected the modern West's equation of Jewishness with femininity, for the new Jew was clearly and unabashedly a masculine creature. It is significant that the initial promoters of this new model for healthy Jewish identity were the Zionist leaders who were educated in the increasingly anti-Semitic societies of Central Europe. Both Theodor Herzl, the charismatic leader of political Zionism, and Max Nordau, the prominent intellectual and popular writer who was his close associate in the early years of the Zionist movement. Both of them shared the anti-Semites' assessment of the social characteristics of diaspora Jewry. However, in Zionism, they saw the possibility for a fundamental transformation of those characteristics through the physical and spiritual redemption of the Jews. In his 1902 utopian no novel, Alt Neuland, Old New Land, Theodor Herzl depicted a flourishing Zionist society in the future Palestine of 1923. That society was populated by Jews who were the antithesis of the materialistic, social climbing, pathetic Jews of the urban centers of Central and Western Europe, the stereotypic Jews of European literature and art at the turn of the century. Indeed, the effect of diaspora life on the hero of the tale, a Viennese lawyer named Friedrich Lohenberg, who was chosen to leave Europe to live cut off from society on a tropical island, is described years later by his noble Prussian companion. Well, our island did not disagree with you, Fritz. What a green, hollow-chested Jew boy you were when I took you away. Herzl's Palestinian Jews were, in contrast, sun-tanned, technologically sophisticated builders of a prosperous new society. Proud of their accomplishments, they had no need to indulge themselves with needless luxury. Although women were given political equality in Herzl's liberal Zionist society and are commended for having worked faithfully beside the men in the period of Reconstruction, they choose to devote themselves to their dom domestic responsibilities in place of civic participation. As a sensible society, those are Herzl's terms, however, Zionist Palestine recruits young women as well as young men for two years of social service and uses, and again I'm quoting, old maids, the single women who were sneered at or looked upon as a burden to conduct public charities. Even more than Herzl, Max Nordau was the most influential in creating and disseminating the ideal of the new Jew. In response to anti-Semitic critiques of Jewish physical weakness, he popularized the term muskel Judentum, muscular Judaism, or muscular Jewry, initially in a brief article that he published in 1900 in the Jüdische Turnzeitung, the Jewish gymnastics newspaper, and in sub uh, subsequent speeches and writing. For Nordau, it was clear that only through conscious effort could the Jew achieve the physical strength that characterized healthy men. Calling upon his audience to take his message to heart, he wrote, let us once more become deep-chested, taut-limbed, bold-eyed men. As he proclaimed the following year in an address to the Fifth Zionist Congress entitled The Moral and Physical Recovery of the Jews, for a number of Jews, even the most proud, 
It is an obvious fact that the Jew is clumsy and lamentably awkward in physical terms, that he is characterized by a pitiable weakness. Nordau's concept of muscular Jewry was designed to counter these unfortunate consequences of diaspora conditions. To realize his goals, the Zionist movement from its earliest years sponsored sports and gymnastic clubs to remake Jewish bodies along with Jewish minds. And the Maccabiyah really flows from this early emphasis on gymnastics. As Michael Berkowitz has concluded in his study of the creation of a Zionist national culture for Central and Western European Jews, these athletic associations constituted a significant means of displaying a new Jewish male type. Exhibitions of the gymnastic clubs, ostensible signs of Zionism's manliness, strength, and vigor, became a greatly anticipated and prideful aspect of the festivities which complemented the Zionist Congress proceedings. Muscular Jewry also made its appearance in the visual representations of Zionism. When the early Zionist movement created official commemorative postcards of the Congresses that portrayed the Jewish future in Palestine, it presented scenes of young and vigorous males engaged in agricultural labor. Although female figures occasionally appeared in the postcards, they did so primarily in symbolic form as the representation of Zionism or of Zion and the happy future that Zionism portended for the Jewish people. That is, they function much as Marianne uh, functioned in the period after the French Revolution as the symbol of France. The usage of Theodor Herzl's photographic portrait was also designed to disseminate a positive male image of the Jew. To cite Berkowitz again, his manliness and handsome good looks consciously rebuked the anti-Semitic stereotype of Jewish effeminacy and ugliness. In fact, participation in the Zionist movement promoted male solidarity as an essential precondition for nation building. Like other nationalist movements of the time, Zionism presupposed a linkage between masculinity and civic consciousness. Male activists were responsible for the direction of the nation, and full membership in the nation was limited to men alone. Most Western Jews, however, did not resolve their questions about their identity and status by becoming Zionists. Zionism did not capture the communities of the diaspora until after the establishment of the State of Israel. While Zionists directly countered the anti-Semitic caricature of the male Jew as a feminized creature through the creation of the new Jew, the majority of Jewish men living in Western societies constructed their identities through a more oblique version of sexual politics. Some highly assimilated Jews internalized the dominant society's representation of Jewishness and projected their own hatred of Jewish characteristics variously on other individual Jews, on other groups of Jews, such as East European immigrants uh, into their societies, or on themselves. Perhaps the most influential and reflective of these self-hating Jews were the young Austrian philosopher Otto Weininger and the successful German industrialist, intellectual, and later statesman Walter Rottenau. Both of them addressed the Jewish question with great concern. Rottenau in the 1897 essay, Hero Israel, and Weininger in his 1903 magnum opus, Sex and Character. Accepting the anti-Semitic critique of Jews as valid, both sought not only to distance themselves from their Jewish origins, but also to eradicate the feminized Jew within themselves. As a young man in 1897, he was 30, Walter Rottenau published his reflections on the Jewish question anonymously in the journal Die Zukunft, The Future, in his essay, Hero Israel. An assimilated Jew, Rottenau was acutely self-conscious about the persistent otherness of Jews in German society. Highly critical of Jewish behavior, he called upon Jews to remake themselves. 
Like many anti-Semites, he commented upon the physical awkwardness of Jews that could be seen as a type of feminization. Look in the mirror, exclaimed Ratnow, if you recognize your poorly constructed frame, the high shoulders, the clumsy feet, the soft roundedness of form, as signs of bodily decadence, you will, for a few generations, work for your external rebirth. Born in 1880, Otto Weininger studied at the University of Vienna at a time when it was rife with anti-Semitism. A brilliant and precocious student, he converted to Protestantism upon receiving his doctorate at the age of 22. Weininger's sex and character combined misogyny and anti-Semitism in a powerfully charged analysis. For Weininger, women and men were polar opposites. Women had no self. Defined by their sexuality, they existed only in relation to men. Jews also re represented a negative element in Western culture. In Weininger's terms, Jews were among those nations and races whose men are found to approach so slightly and so rarely to the ideal of manhood. Indeed, he found Judaism to be saturated with femininity, with precisely those qualities, the essence of which are in the strongest opposition to the male nature. Like women, Jews had no personality of their own, no moral sensibility, no soul, no capacity for genius. Their mode of argument was circular and their aesthetic sense defective. Weininger asserted that the congruity between Jews and women further reveals itself in the extreme adaptability of the Jews, in their great talent for journalism, the mobility of their minds, their lack of deeply rooted and original ideas. In fact, the mode in which, like women, because they are nothing in themselves, they can become everything. The Jew is in constant close relation with the lower life and has no share in the higher metaphysical life. For Weininger, Jewishness, femininity, and masculinity were platonic ideas, cultural types that could be found outside of the Jew, the woman, or the man. Thus, he could conclude, Judaism is the spirit of modern life. Our age is not only the most Jewish, but the most feminine. Disgusted with the ineradicable female and Jewish traits that he found within himself, Weininger acted upon the logic of his philosophy that condemned these characteristics and committed suicide shortly after completing his book. Subsequently, sex and character was translated into several languages, went through 30 German editions, and had a great influence in the field of psychology. Although Weininger and Rattenau do not typify the responses of Jewish men to the anti-Semites' anti cultural denial of their masculinity, their radical discourse points to issues that lay beneath the surface of the Jewish community's sexual politics. Since the gendered division of assimilation served to reinforce the linkage of Jewishness and feminine characteristics, Jewish men doubtless felt a need to distinguish themselves from women and to eliminate any hint of the feminine in their self-presentation. As we've already pointed out, the acculturation and integration of Jews in Western societies transformed the prescribed roles of both men and women, but its impact upon men was far greater than upon women. The Jewish expression and identity of men was reduced in scope. Once they absented themselves from regular attendance at the synagogue and substituted secular education for Torah study, they undermined the, the pillars of traditional Jewish masculinity. Although they continued to run the institutions of the Jewish community, the measure of their success was taken in the larger society. Indeed, their position in the Jewish community often depended upon their achievements outside the community. Jewish women in the West, on the other hand, experienced not the diminution of their Jewish roles, but their expansion. Of course, their level of ritual observance, like Jewish men's, fell 
though apparently at a slower rate. But they experienced their Judaism, however much its content had changed, as they always had, embedded in a domestic context. Because bourgeois society celebrated women's domestic spirituality, the Jewish expression of female Jews was reinforced in the West at a time when male Jews experienced considerable tension between their daily lives in a Christian-dominated society and their Jewishness. Further, Jewish women, as we've seen, acquired a new role that was ostensibly highly valued, the role of transmitters of Jewish culture to their children. They were now held responsible for maintaining the integrity of the Jewish family as the locus of the formation of Jewish identity. The representations of women that appear in Jewish communal literature reflect Jewish men's profound ambivalence about this transfer of responsibility within Jewish families, the enhancement of women's status as guardians of Jewishness, and the further conflation of Jewishness and femaleness. Here I ask for your indulgence as I engage in some psychological speculation. In their communal critique of Jewish mothers, Male Jewish leaders did not acknowledge the newness of the prescribed female role. Jewish women, they argued, had always been the agents of cultural transmission within the community. Yet in criticizing mothers for failing to confer Jewish knowledge to their sons, they were covertly expressing anxiety about the shift of the task of Jewish cultural transmission from the public male domain to the private female domain. Most importantly, they revealed an unresolved conflict about their own loss of traditional Jewish learning and status. They were not compensated for this loss as they had expected by their achievements in the larger society because their mobility was accompanied by a flourishing social and cultural anti-Semitism. Indeed, the eruption of anti-Semitism in the last quarter of the 19th century at a time when most Jews had anticipated its elimination as they realized the project of assimilation, this was a powerful shock to Jewish men who had successfully negotiated economic and social barriers to enter into the middle class. Thus, the social and psychological vulnerability of Jewish men in the late 19th century in Western societies heightened among them the critique of women that was common in bourgeois societies in general. By stressing the strength required to battle for economic success and support their families, Jewish men also found in their identity as men the power that they could not have as Jews in the larger society. These themes of male physical power appear with regularity, not only in the Jewish press, but even in vernacular Jewish prayer books. A popular rabbinic-authored French-language prayer book, first published in 1848 and subsequently translated into several languages and reprinted for decades, I found one from the 1920s, this prayer book highlighted the contrast between male strength and female weakness. As the husband prayed in his personal petition, may I never forget that if might and reason are the prerequ prerequisite of my sex, Hers is subject to bodily weakness and to spiritual sensitivity. May her weakness even serve as a stay against my might, for it would be cruel to abuse a weak and delicate being whom love and law have placed under my protection. Although the male Jew no longer exceeded his wife in Jewish learning, he could take pride in surpassing her in physical strength, reason, and legal status. The tensions surrounding gender and Jewish identity that were most visible in Western middle-class life at the turn of the last century surfaced again in the United States in the generation that came to adulthood in the decades following the First World War. By then, the immigrant task of Americanization had been to a large extent accomplished. Second and third generation American Jews of East European origin had experienced a social and economic mobility outstripping that of any other immigrant group that had arrived on American shores 
in the same era of mass migration, in fact, outstripping uh, even those groups that had come earlier. As we saw in the first lecture, by the 1920s, American Jewish elites no, no, no longer placed the promotion of Americanization at the top of their communal agenda. Mass migration had come to an end, or at least had slowed to a trickle, and immigrant Jews, and especially their children, were accommodating with all due speed to the exigencies of American life. Instead, Jewish leaders identified as a central issue of concern the transmission of Judaism and a Jewish identity to American-born youth. This new goal would be met through strengthening Jewish educational institutions, but also by promoting among mothers a special responsibility for creating and sustaining a Jewish home. Consequently, in middle-class American families in the middle third of the 20th century, as in middle-class Western and Central European families in the last third of the 19th century, regular expression of Jewishness was increasingly relegated to the female domain of the home and specifically identified with women. It should come as no surprise then that American Jewish men who were struggling with the role of gender and Jewishness in the formation of their identities as adult Americans would inscribe their struggle upon the character of women and particularly upon their mothers. The emergence of the demeaning negative caricature of the Jewish mother in the years after World War II represents an American and more moderate version of Jewish self-hatred than its European predecessor. While European exponents of Jewish self-hatred linked Jewishness with feminine characteristics, they directed their attack against Jewish men, in fact, often against themselves, for harboring ineradicable elements of otherness, both ethnic and gendered. In America, Jewish men displaced their self-hatred and denying it, directed their critique at Jewish women. The characteristics that they exposed to mockery could be presented as female qualities rather than as Jewish qualities. Because the object of derision was female and the disseminator of the stereotype was himself a Jew, the ethnic target was masked. As one sociologist demonstrated in her study of Jewish authored joke books, both the narrators and male audience of the disparaging Jewish mother jokes that emerged in the years after the Second World War could perceive the jokes as instances of sympathetic in-group humor because they did not foreground the Jewishness of the female target of the humor. Yet the anxiety that found expression in jokes about and in negative literary portraits of Jewish women revolved precisely around the perceived connection of gender and Jewishness in American Jewish life. Cultural anthropologist Riv Ellen Prell posits that the stereotypes of Jewish women symbolize, through one gender's perspective, the association of sexuality, acculturation, family, and consumption, the key themes of American Judaism in the post-war period. Living in a period of prosperity and assimilation, American Jewish men confronted competing pressures to sally forth from their homes and achieve success and acceptance in the larger society, and yet to maintain their ties to their families and religio-ethnic origins. Women came to symbolize the conflicts inherent in the definition of American Jewish success, for women were represented as the ones who sought both material affluence and Jewish continuity in the home. Mothers and wives demanded from their male kin to prevail in the struggle for affluence in society at large, and yet to set strict limits to their assimilation, particularly by resisting Gentile women. As agents of acculturation, Jewish mothers articulated the goals of Americanization in terms of the acquisition of secular education and professional status. As newly authorized transmitters of Jewish culture, they symbolically maintained the boundaries, preventing their sons from fully entering into the American mainstream. 
The previously celebrated emotional strength and fierce determination of the Jewish mother of Eastern European origins, as seen now by her third generation sons, pointed to an inversion of conventional notions of male-female relations. According to middle-class Western norms, a docile wife deferred to her dominant husband. Yet the controlling and smothering Jewish mother depicted by Jewish novelists and comedians undermined the masculinity of her sons along with her husband. As Philip Roth's self-pitying Alexander Portnoy fantasizes himself as a child saying to his father, it's a wonderful passage, Decker Jake, Surely that's what a goy would do, would he not? Papa, why do we have to have such guilty deference to women, you and me, when we don't? We mustn't. Who should run the show, Papa, is us. The very strength of the Jewish mother is, to the third generation son, a sign of the incomplete Americanization of her family. And the Jewish mother is linked to two elements of Jewish identity that constrain masculine behavior, and especially the Jewish man's free choice of sexual partner. She is linked to both the psychosocial ethnic aspects and to the religio-cultural dimensions of Jewishness. The discourse of gender and identity in both the European and American Jewish communities, as we have so far identified it, was shaped by men and represented the tensions that they experienced in negotiating their own identity in different societal contexts. Did Jewish women make no contribution to the sexual politics of Jewish identity in the modern world? This is a hard question to answer with any confidence, for Jewish women, like other women, have left behind fewer sources for an exploration of their consciousness than have men. Yet the development of Jewish women's organizations, as well as the activities of prominent female la leaders in the past century, provide indirect evidence that Jewish women saw in the prevailing modern gender division of responsibilities an opportunity to assert their own centrality to Jewish communal life. They embraced the responsibility of cultural transmission and, uh, and of maintaining the boundaries inherent in the project of assimilation. In other words, the increased identification of Jewishness and femaleness that induced anxiety among Jewish men enabled Jewish women to lay claim to new public roles. Although the roles and representation of Jewish women in the West and in Eastern Europe differed considerably, Jewish leaders in the modern world increasingly recognized that women's education could not be left to chance. Whether to retain the loyalty of Jewish girls and or to pr uh, prepare them from the hallowed task of educating their children, the Jewish community would have to upgrade the education offered to its female members and thereby diminish the learning gap between men and women. As individuals and as leaders of women's organizations, Jewish women devoted themselves to the Jewish education of their own sex as a means of empowerment, with an acknowledgement that women had a special role to play as the first and most important instructors of their children. In establishing the first middle school for Jewish girls in Warsaw, poor Rakowski was among the earliest of Jewish women educators to create an educational institution designed explicitly for female students. As she indicated in her memoirs, she linked the education of women to the survival of the Jewish people, to which she was committed as a secular Zionist. Her own story, however, demonstrated that education provided a woman with personal empowerment, as well as with the ability to support herself and her family. She clearly had those goals for her students as well. Almost 50 years later, in New York City in 1933, Trudy Weiss Rosmarin, a new immigrant from Germany with a doctorate in Semitics, archeology, span and philosophy, founded the School of the Jewish Woman as an institution of adult education with a similar rationale. 
In a pamphlet that she wrote in the early years of the school and that was entitled Jewish Women and Jewish Culture, Weiss Rosmarin promoted women's education on the well-trodden ground that in our day, the duty of education has been entirely transferred to the mother. Hers is the responsibility both for the physical and for the mental and Jewish upbringing of the young generation. But the Jewish mother could not meet her responsibilities unless she were herself educated in Jewish culture. Weiss Rosmarin went further, however, arguing that Jewish education was important not only for the sake of the Jewish woman's children, but also for her own self, to provide her with a fixed center. To accomplish that goal, the School of the Jewish Woman designed a curriculum that presumed that Jewish women should and could acquire the Jewish knowledge available to Jewish men in modern institutions of higher learning. And the curriculum included Hebrew language, Jewish history, Bible, Talmud, customs and ceremonies, liturgy, and philosophy. It also equipped students for professional work in Jewish education, offering a Sunday school teacher's diploma and credits that public school teachers could use towards a salary increment. Although the primary justification for the education of women was derived from a division of gender roles rooted in the woman's maternal responsibilities, female education also served other needs and expanded women's roles. The multiple implications for Jewish communal life of educating women became most apparent in the activity of Jewish women's organizations. In Germany, the Jüdische Frauenbund, in the United States, the National Council of Jewish Women, Hadassah, and National Organizations of Sisterhoods, and in Great Britain, the Union of Jewish Women, all address the issue of providing Jewish education for their own members. All of these institutions, with the exception of Orthodox Sisterhoods, moved from the call for significant education for women to the assertion of women's claim for equal rights within communal institutions and or the synagogue. The Yudhische Frauenbund, for example, campaigned vigorously for female suffrage within the Gemeinde, which was the formal communal organization of German Jewry in each locale. The National Council of Jewish Women asserted its right to autonomy in managing substantial funds for social welfare work. The Union of Jewish Women in 1904 gained the support of the London Jewish Chronicle for a more responsible position for Jewish women in communal work and councils on the basis of its effective philanthropic and educational activity. We've already noted that reformed sisterhood leaders spoke openly in the 1930s of full equality for women within the synagogue, while the Women's League for Conservative Judaism was instrumental in the creation of a Women's Institute of Jewish Studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. In all of these cases, the rhetoric of domestic feminism broke down the boundaries between the home in which the Jewish woman's primary responsibilities were presumed to lie, and the public sphere of formal education, communal politics, and social welfare. Through their volunteer organizations, Jewish women carried the banner of cultural transmission from the home into the streets and embellished its message to include concern for Jewish survival broadly conceived, along with teaching Jewish morality and customs to one's own children. We've seen that Jewish men and women experienced the process of assimilation in different social contexts wherever they lived and follow different gendered prescriptions of appropriate behavior. As they assumed the mantle of cultural transmitters, did women articulate a vision of Judaism and Jewishness that differed in any appreciable way from the contemporary versions of Judaism promulgated by rabbis and male lay leaders? Such a disparity, it can be assumed, would have had two consequences it would have exacerbated the tensions experienced by men seeking to define an appropriate Jewish identity for themselves, and it would have fed the resentment of women whose power within Jewish communal institutions was minimal despite their duly acknowledged responsibility 
for ensuring the survival of Jews and Judaism. Several feminist scholars have suggested that Jewish women articulated a particularly female form of spirituality that was personal in tone and not based in traditional prayer or study. According to their analysis, in the modern period, some Jewish women have framed their social reform or Zionist activities in terms of a religious mission in which public expression of moral behavior testified to spiritual commitment. Others who saw themselves as religious leaders envisioned an awareness of and communion with God as the focus of their spiritual lives and deemed women's spirituality to be different from men's. Martha Newmark, as the daughter of a faculty member, attended Hebrew Union College and petitioned in 1923, after she completed all the coursework there, to be ordained a rabbi, a request that was ultimately denied. She offered as one rationale for the ordination of women that the spiritual struggles of a woman would be closer and of greater interest to the women who comprise the majority of worshipers in the Reform Synagogue. Such a claim, however, provides little evidence of any substantive difference between Jewish men's and women's struggles. In her work on Lily Montague, a lay minister in England's movement of liberal Judaism, and on Tehillah Lichtenstein, a co-founder of Jewish science, Ellen Umansky has suggested that these two women leaders based their teaching on personal intuition and everyday experience. She sees a possible connection between their stance and traditional Jewish women's religiosity, which may have been associated uh, even in the past with inner piety. This is very suggestive, but despite Umansky's suggestion and on the basis of the evidence that she has provided so far, I have not yet seen in women's writings any theme or style that clearly distinguishes their historical and theological reflections from those prevalent in the denominations with which they were affiliated. Their emphasis on the ethical and on emotional spirituality within Judaism seems to reflect the fact that most of the Jewish women leaders and writers on Judaism in the modern age have been affiliated with reform or liberal movements. However, I will continue uh, to read their writings and to see what can be derived uh, from them. Historians who have focused on the East European immigrant generations in America have highlighted the secular rather than the religious dimensions of women's changing roles. They have posited the emergence of a new Jewish womanhood that built upon the intersection of secular Jewish culture with American conditions of female labor and politics. Secularization, the employment of young women for wages, and the union movement, in the words of historian Susan Glenn, encouraged young women to feel optimistic about making relationships based on a partnership between the sexes and strengthened and legitimated the female presence in the affairs of the community. The growing participation of Jewish women in communal affairs, as well as in American civic life in subsequent generations, built upon the sense of civic responsibility and opportunity and the legitimacy of female political activism that was engendered in the immigrant communities. As contemporary Jewish feminism, which arose some two decades ago, continues to develop and to affect American Jewry, it will be important to see whether and how feminist spirituality influences the ways in which Jewish women express their Judaism, and whether and how feminist activism influences the roles Jewish women play in communal and American civic life. Scholars and communal leaders alike will also have to be alert to the responses of Jewish communal institutions to the new roles and self-definitions of women as American Jews seek to shape an identity for the 21st century. To what extent will the growing visibility of women in the public realm of Jewish communal life 
increase the identification of women and Judaism and thereby exacerbate the sexual politics of contemporary Jewish identity. To what extent will Jewish women choose to invest their energy primarily in those institutions of the larger society that have accepted gender equality as a fundamental aspect of modern life? And uh, while I was in Seattle this week, I finished a, uh, I read a book on, I uh, didn't finish writing a book, I read a book on uh, the Ba'alot Shuva, that is those Jewish women who have turned to orthodoxy. And uh, so I would also say that the, uh, one cannot simply predict that women, because of the uh, concern, growing concern and growing publicity about new roles for women, that women will uh, choose uh, to assert a particularly uh, feminist role for themselves. Uh, some clearly find the issues of uh, Jewish identity and gender troubling uh, and look for a more traditional role uh, for themselves that they uh, are able to find in Orthodox communities. For modern Jews who have lived in societies that promised and often delivered the prizes of civic equality and access to the cultural wealth of Western civilization, both the process and project of assimilation have been gendered. Jewish men and women have confronted the challenges of Western society on different turf. As they constructed Jewish identities appropriate to their circumstances, their behavior also differed. That is, they experienced the process of assimilation differently. Because the dominant cultural model for European and American Jews has been middle class, Jewish thinkers and communal leaders have promoted gender roles reflective of the bourgeois ideal, men in the, in the public sphere, women in the domestic sphere, men responsible for the secular business of running society, women responsible for the inculcation of moral and religious values. The project of assimilation, which was essentially a Western phenomenon intimately linked to bourgeois culture, also differentiated between male and female roles. Presuming that entry into the larger society would be accompanied by the survival of Jews and Judaism, as we've seen, it placed the burden of setting limits to assimilation upon women. In doing so, it expanded women's opportunities for acquiring Jewish education, for exploring the meaning of their Jewishness, and for car carrying their domestic responsibilities into the public domain of social welfare but it also inadvertently promoted among Jewish men the identification of Judaism with women. Faced with the need to establish their own identities in societies in which they were both fully acculturated and yet perceived as at least partially other because they were Jews, Jewish men were eager to distinguish themselves from the women of their community, whom they saw as the guardians of Jewishness. The negative representations of women that they produced reflected their own ambivalence about assimilation and its limits. Exploring gender differences in behavior and representation and laying bare the sexual politics of Jewish identity permits us, therefore, to understand more clearly the challenge, challenges of Jewish self-definition in the modern world. Thank you.